Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Hope we're all connecting. Looks like we all are. This is great. Okay, so thank you for joining us. We're going to start without, you know, might as well get right into it. We've got lots of things to talk about tonight. So my name is Dr. Chelsea Sambles, and I am head of research for the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Center. And I am joined tonight by our speaker, Dr. Lindsay Dodd, who I will introduce shortly. Um, tonight's event is our third co-hosted event between both the Holocaust Center and the Center for History, Culture and Memory at the University of Huddersfield. And we're delighted. It's great turn up for a Wednesday, uh, a rainy Wednesday, I might add, in February. So this is wonderful. My colleague, uh, Hannah Randall, will be helping with the technical aspects of this evening. Uh, she'll be monitoring the chat uh, box. So if you have any questions for Lindsay um, or anything else, please put those questions and comments there. The talk should last about 40 to 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end for discussions and questions. And the goal will be to finish about 6 p.m. So tonight's event will also be recorded and tomorrow you will receive a link with the recording and a short online survey. We would be very grateful if you could complete that survey. We always wanna hear your feedback. So tonight we are proud to host one of our own historians from the University of Huddersfield, Dr. Lindsay Dodd. Lindsay is a reader in modern European history and her research interests include France during the Second World War, oral history theory and practice, Children in War, The History of Childhood, and The History of Everyday Life. She has won a number of grants, and in 2018-2019, she spent a year as a research fellow at the School of Advanced Studies at the University of Lyon in France. She has recently completed her second monograph, which is with a Colombian, uh, Columbia University Press at present. Uh, it's called Feeling Memory, uh, Remembering Childhood Oh, sorry, remembering wartime childhoods in France, and it should be due out in 2023. And it's an incredible book that pulls together over 120 oral history uh, testimonies from Jewish and non-Jewish French children during the Second World War. So welcome tonight, Lindsay. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks very much, Chelsea, and um, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. I'm just going to share my screen with you so that I don't have to multitask. Share. Yes, please. There we go. Can you see that? We can. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, one thing I have to tell you all is, very sadly, I currently have COVID, um, which is why I'm sounding a little bit nasal and um, bunged up. And so um, if uh, I become overwhelmed with the desire to sneeze or cough, um, I will attempt to mute my, uh, mute my microphone um, before I do so, because it's not a very pleasant thing to witness. Um, so um, the paper that I'm giving um, tonight uh, is about as, as a very kind of small um, corner of my research, let's say, um, and it focuses on this building, which you can see in the slide, I hope. Um, yes, you can see that, can't you? Yes. Um, the building that you can see in the slide, which is called Izia. So you'll be hearing me say this word Izia um, quite often. This was a children's home during the Second World War, and I'll be telling you a lot more about that um, in this paper. Um, so, ooh, not working, let me make that work. So, without further ado, um, at the trial of the former Gestapo chief, Klaus Barbie in 1987 for crimes against humanity, the court heard the testimony of two women, Madame Halauenbrenner and Madame Ben-Gigi, the two ladies in the center of this photo. They spoke of their devastating loss. Madame Halauenbrenner's daughters, Mina, aged eight, and Claudine, aged five, had been staying at the Izia children's home when it was raided by men sent explicitly by Klaus Barbie. Madame Ben-Gigi's sons, Jacques, aged 12, Richard, aged seven, and Jean-Claude, aged five, were also arrested. Altogether, 44 children and seven adult carers were stopped mid-breakfast on the 6th of April, 1944. They were bundled brusquely into a lorry 
and taken onwards, onwards towards Drancy camp in Paris, and then the children and most of the adults to Auschwitz, where they were killed. The 44 children of Isier were central to the Klaus Barbie trial. Maître Serge Klaasveld, the great lawyer and scholar, states that children were central to many of the post-war trials he instigated, Le Gay, Brunner, Papon, Bousquet, Barbie. That these men actively sought to kill Jewish children is what made theirs crimes against humanity, which are imprescriptible. On a remote hillside in the Bouget region of the Ain department, which is the foothills of the Alps, the Maison d'Isier opened in May 1943 with the agreement of the local French subprefect. It was opened by Sabine Zlatin, about whom I'll say more later, and her husband Miron. It was a safe house and a home for Jewish children who had been smuggled out and negotiated out of the camps, the internment camps in the south of France, and in fact, identified and scooped up by networks of child saving activists from elsewhere. It operated through the networks of the OSE, the Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, the Children's Assistance Society, which was a Jewish children's charity about which again, I will say more in a minute. 105 children spent time at his year across the 11 months of its operation. Some were already orphaned, others had parents in camps or in hiding. The children were of many nationalities, reflecting the makeup of the Jewish population in France, which had been swelled by migrants and refugees from East and Central Europe during the interwar years. In 1994, the Maison d'Isieux was inaugurated by President Mitterrand as a memorial museum and education centre. At the time, it was one of three sites of national commemoration of the Shoah in France, the others being the Vélodrome d'Hiver and Gur internment camp. Today, the site is open to visitors and welcomes very many school groups. A converted farm building houses the administrative offices, while the museum and archive are in a modern building built into the hillside, which you can see in this photograph. I visited three times in 2018 and 2019, always under a blue sky. From the balustraded terrace, hills upon hills gave way to mountains, which stare right back, eternal witnesses to the crime committed there in 1944. In this presentation, I aim to tell you something about the children of Isier, drawing on the memories of some of those who survived. They were children who had left this place before April 1944. My interest in their stories derives from my main research topic, which is children's lives, or all children's lives. So Jewish children, but, but mostly and largely not Jewish children, um, their lives during the Second World War. I work often at the very small scale, the personal and the intimate. I come across Jewish children, of course, constantly in my work, and I have sought in my forthcoming book, which Chelsea mentioned, Feeling Memory, to treat their experiences alongside those of French children in a way that opens up what was shared, but importantly, what was not. What interests me as an oral historian, that is, um, a scholar who uh, creates and uses recorded, spoken, retrospective, autobiographical narratives to try to understand the past. So what interests me is um, how memory not only reflects those differences, but also generates them. Historical conditions, of course, made children's lives in France very different in, in very obvious ways. So, for example, French children didn't have to wear the yellow star, of course. Um, they weren't ostracized. They didn't go into hiding. They weren't rounded up or deported. Yet two neighbors, one Jewish and one not, might have also experienced the call up of a father into the army, the invasion of France, family separation, the effect of the Allied bombing, or the death of a parent in deportation, sometimes in broadly similar ways. But in memory, the later happening stories of loss, of death, the compound traumas, and the unique pain of the Shoah 
project back across those events and those recollections, imbuing them with different emphases, poignancies, meanings, reflecting the specificity and the magnitude of that event. So memory is not a black box recorder. And many, many years ago now, the great oral historian Alessandro Portelli told us that memory is not a passive depository of facts, but an active process of the creation of meaning. Oral historians like me tend to be less preoccupied with what retrospective autobiographical narratives can tell us about precise names or dates or events, although they can be used for that reason. We're more interested in the processes of remembering in contexts which are intersubjective. The dialogue of an interview or the dialogue that the interviewee has with imagined audiences or with posterity. We're interested in the way that memory stories, as I call them in my work, are just that. They are stories. The human capacity for storytelling, for creating narrative, for implotting one's life is a work of meaning making and gives insight into why things matter in the way that they do. Furthermore, my own preoccupations as an oral historian have grown to be with the idea that memories are made of feeling. I'm also interested in the effective knowledge that we gain and deploy as scholars working with people's stories. I'm interested in the emotions of history, which are live and active in our contemporary worlds. And I'm interested in the textures of the felt realm, past and present. By that, I mean emotions, affects, feelings, but also sensations, moods, atmospheres, daydreams, fantasies. Before coming to Isia and some of its inhabitants, I'll just say something very, very, very brief about the characteristics of autobiographical memories of child survivors of the Holocaust. Those people that Susan Rubin Suleiman has called the 1.5 generation. She says, those too young to have had an adult understanding of what was happening to them, but old enough to have been there. Such characteristics have been studied across disciplines and include, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, list, losing parents as a core trauma point and losing them in great uncertainty so that mourning is deferred. Second, memories that are incomplete, blurred, propped up with feelings, impressions and imaginings. Third, memories that are etched into the body appearing as unconsciously resurfacing sensations and feelings. Fourth, survivors own critical meta-narratives, the questioning, the self-questioning of gaps and absences in memory. Fifth, quite characteristically, often very pleasant times of the time before the catastrophe, uh, pleasant memories, excuse me. And sixth, the sudden disruptive and intrusive reawakening of memory later in life. So these are just some things, some characteristics that you might wish to bear in mind later on in my presentation. Now I'm guessing that not all of you are um, necessarily expert in what was going on in France during this period. So I think it's important that I turn to France and give you a little bit of context about the situation of Jews in France by um, 1940. So at the dawn of the 20th century, there were about 110 French Jewish citizens, mostly assimilated. They weren't usually living in separate communities and were, according to Daniel Lee, mostly rather integrated into French life. Between 1906 and 1939, 150,000 to 200,000 Jewish immigrants came and settled in France, some from North Africa, some from the Ottoman Empire, but the majority as refugees from Eastern Europe. Coming from minoritized communities, which had lived quite separately, been persecuted, defined by their religion, their dress, their customs, these immigrants were somewhat different. They were more likely to speak Yiddish, or more likely perhaps to be interested in Zionist ideas. Yet their children, born in France, sat on the benches of the Republican schoolrooms and, as Daniel Lee writes, quickly became immersed in national life. 
The Jewish children's charity, the Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, you can see it here on the screen, Ose, the letters O-S-E, Ose, um, was a Jewish children's charity and it arrived in Paris in 1933, um, having fled Berlin, which had been the seat of its uh, headquarters. It opened several children's homes in Paris to welcome Jewish child refugees who needed care from Germany and from Austria particularly. In 1939, war was declared. In 1940, the invasion of France began. The French army was rapidly defeated and an armistice was signed. This armistice carved France up. As you can see from the map, the north um, and the west coast became called the occupied zone, occupied um, by Germans. Um, and the French government moved its seat to Vichy in what became known as the free zone. The elderly field marshal Philippe Pétain became head of state in July with Pierre Laval as prime minister. And from October 1940, unprompted by the Germans, the Vichy government began to promulgate anti-Semitic legislation. Having analysed census and deportation data, Serge Klaasfeldt tells us that in 1941, of the 140,000 Jews living in Greater Paris, around 35,000 of them were children under 14. Of the 15,000 Jews living in the rest of the occupied zone, around 5,000 were children. And in the free zone of the 140,000 Jews, about 30,000 were children. Klaasfeldt states, therefore, that there were about 70,000 Jewish children under 14 in France in 1941. His research also shows us that about 9,000 children under 14, Jewish children under 14, under 15, excuse me, were deported from France. He comments that 11.5 of the Jews deported from France were children under 15. He compares that to Belgium where the number was higher, around 20%. Something was different in France. Indeed, around 75% of the Jewish population of France survived the Holocaust. Jacques Semelin has investigated this and his conclusions point to several quite interesting reasons and not necessarily in any particular order, but first, the geography of France was hugely important to the survival of the Jews in France. It's a very large territory bordering two neutral countries, Switzerland and Spain. And it has a rural heartland, which is incredibly rural uh, and, and remote. And it has mountainous fringes, which offered places to hide. Secondly, public opinion in France ended up turning against the government uh, after the roundups of July 1942. There were huge roundups in Paris of 1942. And the, these roundups of Jews continued, but popular opinion fell away. Um, and um, eventually the prime minister Pierre Laval was forced to cease active French collaboration in the policy of rounding up and deporting these children. We also know that plenty of Gentiles were willing to assist um, hiding Jewish uh, people, Jewish children, and Yad Vashem counts over 4,000 righteous among the nations in France. But third, and probably the most important of these reasons, is that the Jewish population of France, in tandem with the international Jewish community, but particularly those in, on the ground in France, were hugely active in their own solidarity dynamic, daring activity to protect Jews and particularly Jewish children. Networks, organizations, humanitarian groups worked extremely hard in mortal danger to hide, protect, protest, to seek emigration visas for Jewish children and adults. So now I'd like to say a few words about how these children arrived at the Maison d'Isieux, the children's home. Look where it is on the map, marked with the red dot. And think back to what I told you about this demarcation line. You might think that this place was reasonably safe because after all, it was in what I described to you as the free zone, the zone that wasn't occupied by um, the Germans. And in fact, the free zone had been a safer place 
for Jews across the first two years of the occupation. And I can show you on a map here. Let me zoom in on this map. Hopefully you can see that. Um, the coloured uh, houses mark um, the children's homes, which were set up by Ose, by the Oeuvre de Secours Enfants, the children's charity. Um, the purple and yellow ones are set up early in the occupation. And these were south of the demarcation line. Um, the, the ones in blue uh, were set up in by 1943. Um, the, the red one that's higher up, that's further north, that is easier. So um, the Ose had set these uh, these children's homes up south of the demarcation line because the, the, the free zone was safer. Yet there were plenty of people in this so-called free zone who were not free. Let me add another layer to the map. These black crosses show to you a small, small proportion. It's an incomplete number. I didn't have time to put them all on, but these ones are relevant to this story. These are internment camps um, in the Southwest and, and um, across the South of France, but, but these were internment camps. Um, and the people living in these camps were obviously not free. They comprised thousands of Spanish Republicans who'd fled the Spanish Civil War and the Franco regime. Jews from all sorts of countries, from France, but also um, from Germany, from Austria, and those uh, some of those Jewish immigrants I'd spoken about earlier. Gypsies, other undesirables, I put that in inverted commas, languished and suffered here. And they really suffered. Let me switch back to my uh, little PowerPoint. So, um, in September 1941, of the nearly 5,000 people who were languishing in um, the camp of Rivesalt, 39% were under the age of 15. And Vivette Samuel, the lady in this picture, was an Ose social worker stationed there from 1941, along with the Red Cross, Quakers and others. And these social workers, like Vivette Samuel, brought humanitarian aid and fought tirelessly to get children out of these camps. And in fact, Vivette Samuel was successful in liberating over 400 children from Rivesalt camp. By the summer of 1942, there were only five children left in that camp, five Jewish children left in that camp. Um, the others had all been liberated from it. More were to arrive, but that's, that's a, the, another part of the story. Um, so they fought tirelessly to get these children out. And with the support of the prefect of the Ero department, um, a children's home was established by the sea in a place called Palavas les Flo, near to Montpellier. And it was run by a Polish-born social worker called Sabine Zlatin. The prefect of that district, so the, the, the local government official of that, of that district, he um, was instrumental in getting those children out of the camps as well, because he was prepared to issue them with special lodging certificates, which meant that they, without which they couldn't leave the camp. So you can see here um, these uh, in, in this image, children who have been um, liberated from those dreadful camps and are recuperating in this um, seaside town uh, of Palavas Le Flo, um, and from there, once they had recuperated, it didn't have that many beds. Once they had recuperated, they'd be sent um, into the centre of France to those rural children's homes. But I've misled you here a tiny bit. Um, Isier as a children's home, so the village of Isier was in the free zone, but Isier as a children's home was never in the free zone. Um, by the time it was established by this same woman, Sabine Zlatin, the occupation of France had evolved dangerously for Jews. So once the Allies invaded North Africa, the Germans could no longer tolerate the existence of this free zone. And the whole of France was occupied by the Germans from 1942. Now, this caused a real problem for the Ose children's homes in the former free zone. Now, large concentrations of children in these children's homes were a real, real risk. Ose changed its policy. The children were rapidly prepared for dispersal into Gentile homes. 
And at a similar moment, due to the Allied bombing campaign, large convoys of children were being evacuated from Paris and other big cities into the countryside. And this provided a reasonable cover for the Jewish children who were dispersed into peasant families. One of the identities that some of the, that these children often had to adopt, imagine how difficult that is, um, was of a, a child who had been bombed, who had been a victim of bombing, um, maybe who had been orphaned by bombing. But if the OSE policy had changed, why was his year, a new home, set up in May 1943? Well, again, I've slightly misled you because there's, a, there's an interesting map that fits in between the two on the left hand side, because from November 1942 to September 1943, when Italy capitulated to the Allies, the area in which his year is situated, which is illustrated in yellow on the map, was occupied by the Italians. And the Italians refused to hand Jews over to the Nazis. So it was within this context in May 1943 that Sabine Zlatan approached the local subprefect to ask if she could move the children's home from Palavas Le Flo, which was now in the German zone of occupation, to Isieux. But after the Italian surrender in September 1943, and the Germans had occupied the whole of this territory. And um, so, so that even that, that bit of space that the Italians had provided had now been wiped out. And 1944, as Tal Brutman has um, written, um, 1944 saw a real radicalization of SS activity out of Lyon in the regions under Klaus Barbie's control. Sabine Zlatan, here she is. Sabine Zlatan was aware of this danger. And on the 3rd of April, she temporarily left Isia to seek a new location. While she was away, the worst happened, a raid, which took her husband, her co-workers and friends and 44 children she was sheltering. So I think you needed some of that context to understand this place and, and how, it, um, how it was functioning. But let me now turn to the memory stories of the survivors of Isia. I'm going to use them to reflect on the place of Isia in these child survivors' memories. To be, wrote the philosopher Edward Casey, is to be in a place. We always are in a place. We are always somewhere. I shall draw upon these memory stories of six people who, as children, spent time at Isia but had luckily by chance left by April 1944. I watched their video interviews in the archives of the Maison des in June 2019. Those interviews had been recorded uh, as video interviews in 2002 during a gathering of former child refugees who'd been called together to help identify the faces of other children in the museum's archive of photographs. Those interviews, of course, took place in French. Um, and so what I present to you in this um, presentation today is my translation. So the place of Isia matters. Place and space are concretely experienced. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to go forward. The place of Isia matters, place and space are concretely experienced and imaginatively construed. Our senses engaged with spaces and places, making sense of them, giving rise to feelings, and therefore generating the capacity for memories to cohere around them. We're constantly putting feelings in place. Place has been described as a concentration of value. It has a felt intensity. It's not just a geographical coordinate. And intensities of feeling are brighter or duller in memory as a result of the meaning of a particular place or space in a person's life world. Paying attention to the place of Isia in these spoken narratives, its landscape, its physical attributes, the mobile qualities of being there, of leaving, of returning, help us think through its place in these survivors' lives. And in fact, its meaning is bound up with their survival. I'm going to draw on the stories of six former children of Isia, including two pairs of siblings. Hélène Wazenson, 
born in 1934 or 35, and I apologize for not having um, uh, having uh, got that detail, but Helene and her brother Bernard was born in 1936. They were two, the two youngest siblings in a family of four. The family came from Luxembourg, and had been evacuated in 1940 or 1941, she says, to Marseille by the Red Cross. They'd been warned that a raid was coming and the three youngest siblings, Hélène, Bernard and Adolphe, were taken to the Ose Children's Home at a place called Boulores and then on to saint Raphael, and then on to Isieux. And this kind of um, odyssey, this kind of multi-home um, multi uh, experience is very common to these children. And they stayed in Isia for about two months. The three children were released to the care of their parents who had settled, so they thought, safely in rural France. But their father was denounced and arrested in 1944. Devastated by this loss, the family moved to Avignon, then to Nice. By coincidence, very strange coincidence, the children's father was deported on the same convoy, Convoy 73, as Miron's Latin, Sabine's Latin's husband, and two older adolescents from Isia who were killed in Reval, which is now um, called Tallinn. Once they realized this connection, years later, the Waisensons, and particularly Hélène, became more involved with the Memorial Museum at Isia. So the second pair of siblings, Alfred Adler, uh, was born in 1934 and he was the youngest of five children. With his brother Edmond, who was born 1931, um, the boys arrived at his year in November 1943 and only stayed for about two weeks. When they left, they were settled and hidden in rural peasant families. They'd been in two Ose children homes before coming to Isia as well. They came from Paris, from a practicing Jewish family of Hungarian origin. Their father was deported from Drancy camp in March 1942 and was killed at Auschwitz. Their mother and older sister Rosa were also deported and killed. But the older two brothers, Maurice and Albert, actually survived. The Adler brothers, it seemed to me from their interview, had not had such strong connections with the Maison d'Isier. So the fifth person is Claude Raiz, and he stayed at Isier the longest out of this group. He was also the oldest. He was born in 1930. An only child, he arrived just after Isier opened, and he left in February 1944. So given that the camp was raided in April, a couple of months later, he had um, maybe the narrowest escape of these people. Um, Claude hadn't experienced a, a particularly traumatic separation from his own parents because he said he wasn't actually very close to his parents. He'd been brought up by a wet nurse. Um, and both of his parents actually survived the Shoah as well. Uh, Claude became good friends with the Waisensons. And finally, Samuel Pintel was born in 1936. He was an only child and his family were of Polish origin. He stayed in his year for around two and a half months in the winter of 1943. Samuel had experienced a brutal separation from his mother and he really experienced this as a traumatic rupture. On the, 19th, uh, on the 16th of November, 1943, a Nazi raid had descended on the hotel where he, his mother, and some other Jewish women and their children had been living in the town of Annecy. He was caught up in the melee and uh, his mother arriving to save him was arrested herself, but not before thrusting him towards a, a bystander, a, a Gentile woman, um, saying to him, go with this woman, I'm not your mother anymore. Stunned, he went with her. She delivered him to the offices of the Union Générale des Israélites de France, the UGIF, another of these big Jewish organizations in Chambéry. And the very next day, so this happened very rapidly for this little boy, he was taken, he was collected by Miron's, uh, Miron's Latin and taken up to his year. Both of Samuel's parents survived deportation. And Samuel himself has been quite involved with the Memorial Museum of Isier. That's how it came across to me from the interview. 
so I want to begin uh, my discussion of these children's memories by um, by by thinking about the memories that they have of actually being there, what actually remains of being there at Isia. Like so many memories of childhood, they are fragmented. And like so many memories of Holocaust childhoods, they're filled with absence and the projection of imminent loss. So Claude Reis uh, was the oldest of these six children and he stayed the longest time at Isia. He arrived just after the children's home was established. And in his interview, he recalled sleeping on hay because the beds hadn't been built yet. He also recalled grape picking in a vineyard behind the house. And he kept returning to this experience of grape picking, a, a seemingly golden memory. Um, and his other survivor friends didn't share this memory. They kind of disputed it and caused him to doubt himself. I think that this dispute and the puzzlement that it created intensify the memory in his account and cause him to dwell on it and return to it. Claude had very positive memories of being at Isia. He said he didn't miss his parents and as an only child he just loved being with the other children and he was really well integrated in the Isia community. He recalled helping Miron Zlatin, so the husband of Sabine Zlatin, he recalled helping Miron bring provisions up the hill. He recalled Miron being very strict with the children at breakfast. And he recalled the smell of the breakfast, woke children every day. Breakfast, it seemed, was a sticky memory. He also remarked on the striking fountain and pool outside the house which is still there today. He said, I remember the water gushed out of the spout. And instead of doing that, he rubbed his hands together under the water, I'd do it like that next to it, i.e. not washing his hands properly. I remember that really well. We didn't wash in it. We didn't brush our teeth or anything like that. And he added of summer 1943, it was wonderful there, I can tell you, we." dive into the, he was laughing here, we dive in the pool, just dry off, having so much fun. In the photos, you can see kids everywhere, half naked, marvellous. I remember mucking around in that fountain that summer. He was really smiling. Well, yes, it was like that. It was like a holiday camp. His account contrasts really starkly with Samuel Pintel's. Samuel was frightened unhappy, brutally separated from his mother, rushed to Isia. Isia was for him a bleak time, surrounded by confusion. He said he thought he was the only Jewish child there, but he knew he shouldn't mention it. His and Claude's memories refract each other. He spoke of this fountain, of this pool as well. He spoke of, he said, breaking the ice in the pool outside to get a little bit of water out and take it into the sink and washing in cold water. So we didn't wash. We were repellently filthy. I had scabies between my fingers, behind my knees, behind my ears, crusty things. Definitely had head lice. Samuel's recollections of Isia were marked by his misery and by the place and by the season. What remained, he said, was a feeling of desolation. It's really, he said, at the end of the world, alone, lost. That's the feeling. My mother won't ever be able to find me again, doesn't know where I am. I can't tell her where I am. She's lost. I'm lost too. That's what you feel at that moment. It's grey, it's cold, it's foggy, it's winter. The place constructed in his memory is deeply, deeply affected by his state of mind on arrival and the gloomy cold winter. Ellen Wazenson recalled actually very little of being at Isia. Her strongest memory is both unusual and mundane. She had a bad cold and was confined to the girls' dormitory. She said, I remember the room where I slept at the top of the children's home. The windows were misted up and I so wanted to go to the school, but they said, no, you have to stay here. 
So I was still being held back, still no school, still not allowed to. So I wrote on the window panes in the condensation with my finger, I wrote, I scribbled. This memory, the clearest specific one she has of actually being there, sticks because of what happened later. Across the rest of her story, we learn of the important place that education and sociality, becoming a normal child, have in her narrative. After her father was deported and the family moved, Hélène was at last able to attend school. This normalising childhood experience and the friends she made, it seemed from her interview, saved her in a way from her mother's grief and socialised her into a language which was not her mother tongue. But here at Isia in 1943, that future was yet to come. She felt isolated, desperate to learn. But the future runs back through her memory, making meaning and holding this scene in place. Similarly, for Alfred Adler, a subsequent trajectory might explain what memories remain. As I said earlier, the autobiographical narratives of child survivors often question themselves and their silences. Alfred interrogated his own memory. He said, I remember having, having a sadness that was an insurmountable sadness, absolutely insurmountable. I really don't, I can't say that I, I'm conditioned by this interview to make an effort to make an effort at real memories, which means you, you look deep inside yourself. The remains of a feeling, the only feeling I have is that. It's my tears. It's, uh, I think I held Edmond's hand a lot. It seems to me that I clung to him. There's no memory of place, buildings, people, rooms, or landscape. All that's left is feeling. That feeling sticks because of the boy's next steps as I will show in a moment. So in these memory stories, time collapses. Memories are always multi-temporal. Future trajectories are bound into recounted pasts. Even for Claude, who remembered his year so positively, this colony de vacances, this place, cannot help but bear witness to its own future. He said reflectively, drawing his imagination into this story. I see the scene. I see the scene. I can't see anything else. I see the scene. I imagine the lorries driving up the hill, the kids there having their breakfast. The last breakfast of the children of Isia, 6th of April, 1944, is remembered by Claude, who was not there. Claude's memories are not only the place as he knew it, but the place he imagines, no less real or meaningful. So as I've suggested, these child survivors' memories of being there at his year are often hazy. For me, these memories are all made of feeling, feeling as sensation and emotion at the time, and feeling generated by subsequent trajectories and acquired knowledge. I also noticed when I listened to the interviews that the movement away from Isia, leaving this place, was frequently remembered more vividly than actually being there. It's hardly surprising that when trying to piece together their fragmented childhoods, leaving looms large because it was leaving that saved their lives. Yet leaving Isia didn't end their problems. For example, it was after the Wazenson children were reunited with their parents that their father was arrested and deported, plunging their mother into grief. Hélène's account of her journey away from Isia is intense with feeling. There are some details, some gaps, but overwhelmingly, those fear, sorrow and loss is encroaching. One day they said, this is what she said. One day they, they said, that's it, prepare your things, you're leaving. I remember a car that took us from the fountain all the way to Lyon. Who drove us? I don't know. Anyway, the three of us, I was eight, Bernard seven, Adolphe ten. They left us at the station in Lyon. In Lyon, I have a feeling of panic, of fear, of cold. It was November. There were Nazis. There were all these people 
everyone was afraid in these stations and we were three children in the in and I think I've repressed a lot of things it's the only way to survive I knew that station was hostile I was afraid I was uh I was so uneasy there but in the end we got on the train their older brother came to collect them from Avignon station and took them to the village where their parents were living but Hélène said with the time we'd been away, I didn't recognize my parents anymore. That was something really awful. I couldn't speak her language anymore, my mother. I could understand the odd thing, but my brother Bernard, he'd completely forgotten everything. He'd say to me, what did she say? I'd translate a little bit. This was our heartbreaking reunion and my mother cried. So the act of leaving Isia saved their lives, but is remembered with great sadness. Edmond and Alfred Adler's memory of leaving is the most vivid memory that the boys have of his year. I told you before that Alfred, the younger brother, recalled little but his own insurmountable sadness of their two weeks at his year. But this turns out to be rather meaningful. His older brother Edmond said, we were children from a practicing family and I begged, I pleaded with Madame Zlatin for a prayer book. Naturally, Madame Zlatin told me that she didn't have a prayer book and she couldn't satisfy my demand. So I started to cry all day, every day. I cried, I blubbered away. My brother, who's younger than me, he followed me around crying. So with these two crybabies in the house, well, Madame Zlatin, with more than 40 other children there, she had other fish to fry. So she sent us away again. That insurmountable sadness got them sent away. It saved their lives. This account in the interview was challenged by the interviewer who, um, uh, who, who seemed to, to, to uncomfortable with this portrayal of Sabine Zlatan. But Edmund's not criticizing Sabine Zlatan here. In his account, it's their childish whinging and their insistently articulated religious needs that led Sabine Zlatan sensibly, Edmond seems to be suggesting, to wish herself rid of these two irritating children. Years later, they were able to thank her in person for saving their lives by sending them away. Finally, all of these survivors returned to his year, and not just in 2002 for these video interviews, but before, often before it became a memorial. Some hadn't even realized they'd been at Isia, and it only realized when the distinctive balustraded terrace, which you can see in the image here, um, was shown on television during the Klaus Barbie trial. Going back for Edmond and Alfred Adler was an act of curiosity. Edmond said he didn't recover memories by going back there. He discovered the place like any other visitor. And Alfred commented, when I returned years later, it was under a radiant sun. I didn't recognize anything at all. And I didn't experience any kind of emotion, either from the landscape, which is very beautiful, or from the house itself, nothing. Samuel Pintel also commented, uh, commented on the weather in this landscape of his memory. He said, now if I come to Isia in May, nothing, nothing at all. It's very pretty to look at, but it doesn't evoke anything. When I come in winter or November, it's very evocative. It's strange. It makes feelings come back. It doesn't make precise things come back. Oh, I ate this. I did that. Not at all. It makes feelings come back. Emotions. Ellen Wazenson also spoke of returning to Isia for the first time in 1985. She said, Arriving here in front of the fountain, it was a shock. I'd repressed it all. And in one fell swoop, everything came flooding back in my memory. When I saw the terrace, the house, all of a sudden I said, yes, I was here. I had a real shock. As with Samuel, it is the place of Isia, its specificity that awakened memories and for Hélène confirmed what she knew but couldn't remember. Going there also acted as a confirmation for Claude. Doubts 
that those hazy memories of the grape, the grape picking and the vineyard corresponded with um, lived reality had grown in his mind. He visited, um, happened to be passing in 1973 with his family. He got out of his car, looked around and he cried, look at that, grapevines. But mostly Claude was overwhelmed by thoughts of his friends. He said, I said to my children, this is the house where I was during the war. I remembered the environment, but I didn't want to accept that, that the children who'd been there with me had been deported. That, that made me feel awful. I went down the hill by myself and I cried like a child. I want to conclude this presentation with a few reflective comments about how and why I think these aspects of these narratives made such an impression on me as I listened to them in the archives at Isia in 2019. Because the substance of this paper, this paper I'm giving you, talking to you about today, it's existed since 2019, since June. Well before I agreed to speak today, well before you know, any of this um, was happening, it's already existed in my mind. And I said earlier that I'm interested in the way that we as historians, as scholars, gain and deploy what I call effective knowledge. And by that, I mean knowledge that I might acquire from the felt realm around me, from sensation, feeling, emotion, mood, atmosphere, in short, from what we call affect. I believe that doing historical research is an inter-affective process. The researcher may act upon the stuff of the past, but the stuff of the past acts upon the researcher. As my colleague Jodie Matthews has written recently in a special issue of the journal Oral History, which I co-edited, the people we study change us. They make us experience physical, visceral reactions. They affect us. They cause us as people to lean in to particular aspects of their experience. Our relationship with the people of the past, when we allow it to, triggers our attention and leads us to focus on one thing or another. We are subjective entities and we cannot be but otherwise, moved, touched, affected by the stories we encounter. More than that, we encounter those stories in a place. And what happens when we encounter the stories in the very place they describe when we can walk and touch the objects there in that photo, in that story. I want to therefore end by just opening this conversation about doing research in place and how the effective knowledge we gain from that place acts on the research we do there. For example, going to Isia was difficult for me. I didn't have a car. There's no public transport. It's up a giant hill. It was an effort and it brought home the effort that Klaus Barbie chose to make when he chose to go and hunt those children in that remote hillside. We derive knowledge from feeling, effective knowledge. I stayed in a strange old farmhouse. and I was alone in this deserted building, like seriously alone in of the village a kilometre from the Maison d'Isier. And in the evenings I sat alone in the dark. I kept the shutters closed because there was an intense heat wave. And I kept the lights off because there were so many flies. It gave me a really strange feeling of being lost, of nobody knowing where I was, of vulnerability. The heat was intense, over 40 degrees. In that heat, any stories of cracking ice shine brighter. I trailed my hands in the pool where the children had played and I sat under their tree where Jacques Benguigi dressed up, where he played and where he laughed. My experience has nothing to do with theirs except that it is through me that part of their story is being told today. My point is that being at Isia generated strange feelings and affects the way that I listen to, think about, talk and write about these people. It sensitized me to certain emotional states. It created resonances. It made me feel my thoughts in a particular way. 
Isia is a beautiful place, but its beauty is complicated and it's hard to enjoy. And so for all that the house and the museum are interesting, it is perhaps the place of Isia that makes the most meaningful mark. Thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was so interesting on various levels. Um, uh, everyone who's in the audience, feel free to put a question or comment into the chat, but I'm going to take speakers' rights and I'm going to, or host's rights, I'm going to ask the, the first question. All right, Lindsay, so that's, that's a hard one because we are trained researchers, historians, scholars who are told we need to be objective, we need to be unemotional, we need to be uh, looking at our subjects in a way that's balanced, rational, unaffected, right? And we strive for that level of objectivity. And of course, we're all subjective. And of course, no research can ever be fully objective. But <sighs> I mean, you're getting into really wonderful, murky, delicious gray zone there by really confronting and embracing some of those emotions that come with really upsetting research about a really pivotal moment that we can all relate to because we're all children at that point in time. Do you feel that that makes you more confused as a historian and as a researcher? Or do you think that that makes you better because you have a, a larger, you know, emotional depth and scope, at least, uh, in your arsenal to be able to attack these sort of to topics and look at them. I, I feel like I would be confused. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said we're trained to be uh, objective and we're trained to strive for objectivity and all of these things. These are simply conventions you know we're only trained to do these things because that's what someone 150 200 years ago said we should do as historians and um i don't see why that we as historians can't be more like scholars from other disciplines and use ourselves within our research more um so um we don't all have to do it and i would never advocate other people doing what i do um it's risky and it gets you some really stinking reviews from time to time but um I don't believe it makes me more confused. I think it gives me more clarity because I can look at things as myself. I don't have to pretend to be somebody else. I don't have to pretend not, not to care. You know, I, 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 I can bring, if I can bring myself into the research that I do, I don't want it to be about me. It's not no. about me, no. but how can I, um, I think it's more honest if you recognize the ways that you have intruded into the research and that your emotional um, uh, repertoire is one of the tools that you use as a human being to interact with other human beings, whether they're dead or alive. So um, no, for me, it's, it, it's, it's a kind of simple convention that I wish to buck. Um, and uh, I certainly find have found much more joy in my research by being more emotionally open. Yeah, no, I, and, um, I think it's an interesting perspective. I think it would be highly challenging for lots of people because we like to shield ourselves from our research because especially when it comes to the Holocaust and the Second World War, like it is upsetting. These things are some of the most upsetting in modern history. So to engage with that and to get really sort of down and dirty for lack of better phrase, it's really, um, it's really interesting, it's really compelling, and it's, it's really in inspirational. So I want to just take a look at a couple of the other comments, because you can see that they're pouring in and everybody's saying you've done such a great job tonight. So we have Lisher Camille, who said, thanks so much for putting on this great talk. She missed the start, but she wanted to share that there's very similar stories of French child or uh, children refugees told in a very moving and well done film, Fanny's Journey, which I've not actually seen. Have you seen that? No, but I came across it just, um, I think, yesterday in something I was reading. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of coming into this um, topic a little bit more. And I'm hopeful, you know, I'm going to be doing some research at Yves Salt later on. And I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm discovering these stories. So thanks very much, Cammy. Uh, that, yeah, thanks for the, thank, thanks for the link for that. Brilliant. That's a that's a good point. You also brought up Reeve Salt. I had a question about one of your statistics. If I've got this right, maybe I was wrong. But at one point you said that 39% of internees at Reeve Salt were 
children or under the age of 15. Is that yeah, right? that, yeah, that's that's the statistic that is in in the documentation. It's it's a you know a, a document. Um, I I'm, why why was it so high? Why because because it's it's families. You know, it's um, it, it's mothers with plenty of children who are coming and uh, people who have been escaping in family groups, but the men get taken off. Um, so yeah, it's it's a large it's a large proportion at that point in time. But people like Vivette Samuel were so successful in getting those children out of Rivesal when she arrived. You know, there there was this very high number, and um, you know they the conditions that they were living in were were absolutely horrific. Um, and uh, she did manage to get the number down to five children, which is incredible. incredible. Um, and those five children were children whose parents refused to sign the documentation to let them go. And they didn't survive. So yeah, it's, it was um, really, really difficult position. But I'm, I'm going to, to be doing some archival research down there. So hopefully I'll get the get the stats and, and you know, and, be able yeah, to no, think I mean, about them more. I, yeah, I believe the stats, I believe your fact is just that it seems well, really Well, I don't high. know, because Vivette Samuel mentioned 20,000 people there. So that's why I'm a bit confused by the statistic that I've got, which says 5,000. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% on what those stats are saying at the moment. No worries, no worries. So um, we have also Charlotte, thank you for a wonderful and insightful presentation. Alan says there is an ongoing French TV series called La Dame de Isieu. Has any of the survivor children commented on it? I'm not sure if we've heard about this or not. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know about that. La Dame de Isieu is Sabine's Latin. That's what she's known as, La Dame de Isieu. Um, I didn't know there was a TV uh, program about that. Not living in France, um, uh, you don't kind no. of get get these things. And it did, you know, as I said, this isn't my kind of central research topic. But um, I am sure that the Isia survivors have been, you know, their testimonies and their contributions, their knowledge of the place and the woman uh, will have all been contributing to that. But Sabine Zlata, you know, she survived whenever she came back and found her her children's home um gone and uh you know it's she she was very instrumental in building it up as a memorial museum but she's quite a controversial figure which is why i think she's interesting uh, and and it's interesting that there should have been that that um tv series made about her because she's she has her own controversies mm. um yeah yeah very interesting no well i mean and um for her to also want it to be a memorial after the fact. I mean, that's that uh, has a lot of foresight to it. That's somebody that's thinking very far, or not foresight, well, for, yeah, foresight, but somebody who's thinking very far in the future. That's incredible too, right? Um, a question from Hannah is, why is you over any of the other uh, children's homes? Why did you focus on this one specifically? Oh, just, um, I happen to be there, Hannah. Okay, <laughs> like how much, you know, research. Um, I, when I was a, a research fellow um, in uh, Lyon, um, I was invited by colleagues to go up to Isia to, and the director welcomed me and I sat in on lots of their meetings. And um, so it was just really through that, through the capacity of being able to get there. Um, when you research France from Britain, you take these opportunities where you can get them. And so that's why I ended up at Isia. Um, all of these places have been studied by other people. I'm not treading new ground. Um, what I do, what I've done differently is analyze the, the narratives, the oral histories, and that's usually where I come in and do something slightly different to other people. So all of these children's homes have amazing historians who've worked on them and who have written their stories uh, uh, in the kind of narrative style um, and, and done the research already. So, you know, I'm standing on other people's shoulders when I talk about this. But what I think hasn't really been done is that kind of forensic and effective type of analysis of children's stories themselves, which is what I've done uh, across my forthcoming book, you know, for the whole of that book. That's that's what you're getting in that book is that that absolutely granular level of the analysis of memories. Um, and so, yeah, is the, uh, it, I just happen to be nearby. So that that's kind of why. But that there, there's a lot of them. Um, these children's homes and they're all 
they're, they're all kind of interesting, but they don't all have the tragic history of Izio, I suppose, as well. And Izio had that really central part in the Klaus Barbie trial as well. You know, it's a key piece of evidence. So it, it does have a special history, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And children are so symbolic of innocence. So for Klaus Barbie to take that and be that that particular raid to be used as a moment to incriminate him, you know? Sure, but I think even more than that, in a practical sense, a child was could never have been misconstrued as a, a political adversary. Mm -hmm. So that innocence is symbolic, but it's also very practical that um, it's a crime against humanity. If, 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 it's, if you are acting, as Klaus Barbie did, viciously and violently towards French resistors or towards adult Jewish um, resistors, I'm not saying there's a justification for that, but you could argue, as your lawyer would and did, um, that that's a war crime. And war crimes are not imprescriptible, so he couldn't have been um, he couldn't have been accused. He couldn't have been convicted of that. Whereas the children come in because crimes against humanity are imprescriptible, so he could still be got on that. Um, so, so there's a really real practical reason for it as well as well as the symbolism of the whole thing. It's actually legally um, astute yeah. to get those children involved as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, we, I, you know, I just can't emphasize enough how wonderful these comments are. Thank you so much for your research. It's so eloquent. Oral history is queen. Thank you, Adele. Um, if history had been taught in a similar vein at school, it would have caught my imagination. That's a lovely compliment. And Alan says there have been quite a number of films that cover these types of subjects. Waiting for Anna by Michael more poor go, even the latest film by Jess Eisenberg that covers the wartime exploits of Marcel Marceau. Yeah, definitely. And uh, on my module that I teach at Huddersfield as well, we look at um, the, the place of these films about Jewish hidden children in France. Um, it's a very common trope in filmmaking. And, we, you know, I ask the students, why do they do you think they use children all the time in these films? And I think it's that that innocence, that way that you can use a child as exposition um, of this kind of hideous unfurling situation. But, it, you know, they make good and they're, they're dr dramatic stories that some of these children uh, lived through the, the, the what they did was remarkable, you know, and what a little child had to take on an identity of someone, you know, um, the Adler brothers, one of them, they were put into two separate peasant households. Um, one of them had to pretend he was a Protestant boy from Lille, uh, the city of Lille, and the other had to pretend he was from Paris, which he was from Paris, and that he um, was a, a bombing victim, which he which he had experienced bombing, so he could maybe play act that a little bit more. But it was very difficult for particularly the younger children to dissimulate. And it was often the younger children, they really tried to, to get the, um, the emigration visas for or to get them put into um, collective establishments, um, convents and so on. A lot of them went to Lourdes for example, um, just because so, they couldn't dissimulate in the way that older children were able to. Incredible, just incredible. No, it's uh, it's amazing what these children went through and the challenges that they had. I'm going to wrap things up here. I'm just going to uh, read one more comment from Pat Callum. Um, that was fascinating. Raised questions about whether we can do this kind of intersubjective history for earlier periods. Pat, hello, medievalism. And perhaps that is a question for another time um, to take care, Lindsay, of yourself, of course, right? So without any further ado, um, as mentioned, everyone, tomorrow we're going to send out the recording and a short online survey. If you can please complete the survey, Hannah's even shared it in the link, that would be great. Also remember that we have another couple uh, Chai Cam events going on this academic year. So follow us on Twitter. You can see the link now in the, the chat as well, as well as uh, the Holocaust Center's events are ongoing. Feel free to join those as well, share the link. But I would like to thank uh, first um, our speaker, Lindsay. Thank you so much, truly. Yes, everybody's uh, doing the clapping. Thank you so much for such an insightful and pro provoking and stimulating and inspirational talk tonight. 
that was really interesting and, and really cool to see the texture of emotions, as you said. It was great. You really did that well. And Hannah, thank you very much for the uh, technical support and for everyone for attending this evening on an otherwise cold winter's evening. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>